Good morning, everyone. Is it a good morning? It is a good morning. Amen. I'm glad you're all here. Hallelujah. The first day of Advent celebrating. We had all of the Christmas decorations last week, but today is really the first day of Advent, and um, every time I Every time I enter the sanctuary and see this banner, it just does my heart good. And I remember putting that banner together when it was strung out down the hallway of uh, the hallway there with the, where the bathrooms and the parlor are. And, and we uh, laid out pieces and ironed them on and, and uh, just had a, a wonderful, fellowship uh, putting that together and designing that and it does my heart good to think that here we are Topeka and Bethlehem is overlooking our capital city isn't that just cool and the and the star is there to represent that Christ is born Christ is born in Bethlehem and in Topeka Kansas I have, so I'm glad that you're here to worship with us today. A few announcements for you. Um, I will tell you that uh, as league director of Upward Basketball, I am in dire need of five coaches. We have uh, almost 20 teams this year and I am down to five coaches. So. Practice starts this week, so you don't have to have training. We train you. You don't have to have someone in the program. Just come and enjoy and uh, be a part of these uh, uh, young people's lives. It would be great if you could. And if you can, see Dennis Slimmer or myself. I'd appreciate that. Uh, another announcement is that um, we need to cancel the senior and youth trip that we were gonna take this evening to um, Horton to see the lights because it's just, there just wasn't the interest. And so we're going to cancel that trip tonight. Um, the youth have a video that they would like to show if you wanna do that now. <laughs> So now you know, the youth have some fundraising activities going on. Um, one of those is tied to the Christmas scavenger hunt on December the 7th. Uh, the information on that is on the inside of your bulletin, and I understand that they're needing some items, so you can check that out. And then on December the 8th, there is a, a chili luncheon uh, that is kind of like a chili cook-off. Uh, so that you can vote for the best chili that you, that, uh, after church. So keep that date open for chili lunch here on the 8th, uh, following worship. Um, I think that's it. You can read the rest, right? All right. Let's, uh, as the handbell choir comes forward, I would like to start our first Sunday of Advent with this reading. 
Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. The darkness has long been upon us, and we wait for the light, the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. It has not yet come. We wait and we watch for the dawning of God's glory. This reminds us to stay awake and watchful, for the promised one will come to us at an unexpected hour. The message today is to stay awake and be ready.
Good morning, church. I'm going to invite um, Marvin and Kathy Trahoon to come forward. They are going to, to do our, our first Advent reading. As we enter into this time of Advent, Advent is a season of preparation. It's a time to remember what Christ has done and the promises in which Christ still has to fulfill for us today. So as we look at the wonderful decorations that we put up, the evergreen leaves remind us of God's everlasting love. Uh, when you see a wreath, you notice that God's love is eternal. It continues on and on and on. And the many lights, especially the lights of the Advent candle, remind us of the light that Jesus brings into a dark world. So each Sunday, we will light a separate candle. We will have a responsive reading, and we will have a time of prayer and anticipation as we celebrate through this season together. The final candle, the center candle, the white one, will be lit on Christmas Eve. So in your bulletin, you have an insert. I would like you to take that out now if you would. And on one side of it, you'll see the, the pieces for responsive reading. Marvin and Kathy will, will lead us through most of this, but at the very end, you will see a, a bolded part, and that's for you. So when, when we get to that place, we will all uh, speak together um, for that. So Marvin and Kathy, lead us, please. Today we enter Advent, a season of possibilities, a time of not yet. Our daily lives reflect human struggles. Sometimes we are surrounded by brokenness in our lives among our friends and families, in our worldwide family. Hope seems a far off vision, yet we yearn for it to fill us. We hope together. As a church family here today, we come together in a celebration of hope. But what do we hope for? As we head towards Christmas, we often hope that we can find the perfect gift to give, the perfect outfit to wear, the perfect tree to decorate, but the first Christmas was far from perfect. The hope of the nations came to us on a night of messy circumstances. The light of the world was born in a stable, laid to bed in a feeding trough, and was attended to by field hands. They were messy circumstances, and yet it was just right for Christ, for Jesus Christ, a perfect child surrounded by all of the love two parents could give. This morning we light the candle of hope as we pray for Christ to come into our hearts again. in this season that we miss out on the hope that only you can bring to us. Amen. Thank you. Let's all stand and join in song. O come, O come, Emmanuel, number 133.
seated. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, in this time of preparation for the celebration of Christmas, let us pray for the needs of God's whole world, for a world that is fragmented by wars, complaints, injustices. We pray for peace, hope, and goodwill over all the earth. Hear us, O oh God, in our heart of hearts, in our prayers, that we ourselves pray and we pray as a church. We pray for reconciling love and unity within the church and within the world so that we may better minister to the world and share the good news of your son, Jesus. We pray for the poor and the helpless, those who are out in the cold, whether they choose to be or whether they don't. Lord, wrap your loving warmth around them. We pray for the hungry and the oppressed. And we ask for those who have suffered that you be with them. We ask for those that are in sadness and mourning that you comfort them. We ask that those who are lonely and feel unloved that your light will shine into them and show them that they are indeed loved. Give us, God, your strength to be your people, to be your ministers in this world. We pray for those who do not know you, who have not heard about you. We pray for them that the word may reach them. Thank you for our missionaries and for others who are able to go out and to reach into areas where there are still places, God, where you and your voice of your son Jesus is still silent. May we reach those inner corners of this world. We pray for all of those that stand as clouds of witnesses to our lives and to the work that we do, not just in this church, but in our own lives. May we honor our past. May we honor that which has been before so that we may move forward with peace, with love, with hope, with joy. I offer my prayer in the name of Christ the one and only Lord Savior. Amen. Amen.
you have the children come down for our story time? Come here, Tyson. Come sit right here. So how many of you have ever had to pick out a name for a pet? I have some hands up. Okay, so for those of you that have had to pick out a name, was it hard to pick the name? Yeah. There's some no's and there's some yeses. How many of you had a long list of names that you, you liked? Uh, no, I didn't. You didn't? No? Yeah. No? Huh? Yeah? No? All right, how many of you have like, like two names you couldn't decide between? Uh, yeah, okay, I've got, I got some head nods. Yeah. It's kind of hard. Your parents did it. it oh, awesome. So you didn't have to be a part of that decision. Gotcha. So picking out a name can be a little bit difficult. Well, I wonder how hard it was for Mary and Joseph because the prophet Isaiah gave several names to Jesus. Can any of you kind of guess maybe some of those names? Hmm, no? Blake? No, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's actually one of them. Any other guesses? No more guesses? All right, well, here, here's one that Isaiah, the prophet, says would be Jesus' name. Wonderful Counselor. Another one would be Mighty God. Another would be Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and Emmanuel. That's five names right there. So how in the world did Jesus come up with just the name of Jesus? Five. Yeah. There's five names that is here. And, I, and each one of these names have a different meaning. Wonderful Counselor is the hope that Jesus would be very wise. Mighty God has the hope that Jesus would be protector and help out his people. Everlasting Father means always will be. Prince of Peace, I'm pretty sure y'all can imagine what that means, right? Bring peace to everywhere. And then Emmanuel also means God with us. Now, I want you to think, does Jesus do all of those things for us? I have some head nods. I have some very thoughtful looks going on. Because guess what? We, have, we get to experience Jesus with all these different names at different times. And so that's why I, I brought up the thing about naming your pets, because you had hope as you named your pets that the name would fit them, right? Yeah, and you didn't want it to be a bad name that your pet wouldn't work. Hold on just a minute, Ty, okay? No, we're not going to talk about the what-ifs right now, okay? I know, it'd be fun to do the what-if game, but I don't have that much time. And so your hope was you picked the right name and that your pet would, you know, live up to that name. And that's what Jesus does for us. With all the names that Isaiah told us Jesus would be, the hope is, is that Jesus would be each of those things for us. And Jesus has been and will continue to be. Let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you so much for, for bringing Jesus to us and bringing us hope, as well as peace and wisdom and all the names that Isaiah gave to us. Please help us to continue to learn and to grow. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, those of you who go into children's church, go that way towards the door, and the rest of you go back to your parents. Good morning. Before... What? Okay. Oh, okay. 
We're going to sing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we're going to sing The Lion and the Lamb. Please stand and join us if you're able. This may be a new one for some of you. Um, join in as you feel comfortable and lift our voices to the Lord. one of the really cool wreaths that you can uh, get involved with and um, it has a it has a blink it makes noise and it lights up isn't that neat okay so we our fundraiser right now is called vote us to Kodiak you've been hearing about this there are two ways that you can donate the first is wreath wars and you can vote on which wreaths you like and the way you vote is pennies and paper money add votes in the jars to the wreaths that you like best and silver coins subtract from the wreaths I guess that you don't like which I can't imagine you not liking any of them and apparently there are not very many votes going on so you need to get money in the jars no taking away add money well, I guess, I guess you can take money away. Any money in the jars will count. And this is just one sample. Lots of really great wreaths. The second way that you can donate is to silent auction. And then you can take any or all the wreaths home with you. Personally, I think this would be a great one because, like I said, it makes noise, it lights up. So need you to get in there because the voting and the bidding goes through the uh, hospitality time on December 15th. And then the votes will be counted up at the end of the hospitality time and the bidding will be counted up at that time and the um, winners and the bidding will be counted up and we'll announce the winners then. So we need your help to get us to Kodiak, Alaska. So get in the parlor, take a look at the wreaths, and sign up, put money in the jar, help us out. All right, thanks, let's sing. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down, and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise, for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, 
His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion. The Lion of Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Thanks. You may be seated. Let's join together in a word of prayer as our ushers make their way forward to receive this morning's offering. God, you work in amazing ways beyond what we can see and understand. And even with this offering, with those who make decisions on how it will be used, with those that this money will, will impact in a special way for your kingdom, for those who will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, for those who will receive some sort of assistance to those in other countries who will hear the gospel for a first time in a unique way, for those who will be shown love who don't feel loved, for all the various ways that these coins and dollars and checks go to spreading your good news, Lord, we give you thanks, because you use them and this money in a special way. And may you multiply it beyond what we can ever imagine to do the work in which you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. song, Come As You Are.
Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face, oh wanderer, come home, you're not too far, so lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who've strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary and rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burden. Lay down your shame, all who are broken, lift up your face, oh wanderer, come home, you're not too far, so lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, Come as you are, come as you are, fall in his arms, come as you are. There's joy for the morning, O oh, sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Come home, you're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Come as you are. God is good, amen? Amen. amen. I want you to raise your hand if you've ever heard one of those lost at sea stories. You ever heard about one of those? I want to share one with you this morning as we begin our new sermon series, God With Us. In the summer of 2017, two longtime commercial fishermen, John Eldridge and Anthony Soseski, I think is how you pronounce his last name, set out to fish off of an island, and they were headed out to sea, um, and they were about 40 miles or so offshore. Anthony was sleeping below deck while John started to get things ready for the catch that they would soon uh, haul in. 
And he was pulling on a handle with all of his might, and it was just stuck. And pulled and pulled and pulled, and finally the handle broke off, sent him kind of just going backward, and he fell off of the boat. And the boat was on autopilot, so it just kept going. And no one was really aware. But as soon as he fell in, he resurfaced to the top of the water, and he began screaming at the top of his lungs for somebody to hear him, but there was no way that Anthony was going to hear that he, he had fallen off the boat, and he didn't hear him. So John watched as the boat went from the crest of the wave into the distance, and he could no longer see the boat, and then it was gone. And like that, he just couldn't see anything anymore but water. He was alone. He was treading water in the middle, middle of the Atlantic Ocean. He was without a life vest. And he was thinking that today was probably going to be the day that he died. Can you imagine what he felt like? Have you ever been on a boat where all, all you have seen surrounding you is just water? Can you imagine what he was thinking? If there was ever a hopeless situation, I, I would think this, this would be it. But while John was trying to calm down and quiet his spirits and just sort of accept the inevitable of what was going to happen, he was trying to stay afloat and he realized that there was a way to do this. He realized that his boots could help him to, to stay buoyant. So what he did is he took off his boots and slammed them into the water and he created an air pocket and that air pocket allowed him to float. And so John stuck his boots under his arms as a flotation device. And at last he could float, and then there was a flicker of hope. During that time of just sort of bouncing up and down in the water, I would imagine that John thought about his family, the fact that no one knew that he was missing, except maybe two sharks that swam about 15 feet away from him. But unfortunately, they didn't seem to care at all. He thought about the goals that he had the rest of his life and thought about would he make it until morning. Four hours later, Anthony from the boat awoke and realized that John was missing. He called the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard began it, their procedures in trying to find him. And the Coast Guard com commander admitted that probably he would not be found because he was just floating simply in open water, and it had been several hours. So then as Anthony was going around the boat, he, re he realized that that particular handle was broken, and thought about what time John would have been doing that part on the boat, and that helped the Coast Guard helicopter to fly by. And so the Coast Guard helicopter did find John, and John had found a buoy out in the, uh, the middle and was just sort of on top of that, yelling and screaming and hollering. And finally, the Coast Guard pulled him to safety. And they said, we've been looking for you for nine hours. And he says, well, that's ironic. I've been looking for you for 12. <laughs> so miraculously, John survived what really shouldn't be a survivable situation. And this is an amazing story with an amazing amount of hope. I think if I was in a similar situation out in the middle of the ocean and all I could see was water, I wouldn't think enough to take off my boots and smack them into the water and use them as flotation devices. I think I would lose hope. I think that I would just think, and it's just time to give up. No one's going to find me. And all of those things that kind of run through our mind. But that's sort of how hope works. Hope is this whisper of maybe, just maybe, if I throw my boots into the water just hard enough, it will allow me to float. So what does hope look like in your life? When you've gone through difficult situations and you've not known what else to do and you're sort of floating out in the middle, so to speak, what does hope look like for you? For some, hope is a candle lit when the storm goes out and you hope it lights. Sometimes it's the first day that you wake up and you can breathe again after an awful cold. Hope can sometimes be the percentage of what you do when you're trying to beat a long-term illness. Hope is the faint line on a stick when you've been trying to get pregnant for a long time. 
Hope is the first sign of sunshine after a tearful, dreadful night. Hope is the first uh, soldier to land on a beach. Hope is hearing the words from a friend or family member that it's going to be okay. Hope is the flicker of the thought of maybe, just maybe, this will work out all right. Hope is the fuel that uh, fuels faith in our dreams. And hope is what we celebrate here the first season of Advent. See, the word Advent means coming or arrival. And this season is marked with expectation, wanting, and anticipation, and longing. Advent is not just an extension of Christmas. It's not just simply candles that we light and decorations that we put up. But it's far more than that. It's looking back and understanding that Christ came in a, in a manger, it was God's Son so that we can have victory over death and life everlasting. It was a promise that God had given to His people because they were in depression. They had, they had been in, in exile. They had been in bondage. And it was just this horrible situation for them. So in the midst of all of that wrongness that was going on in their life, God said, I'm going to send to you, just like Pastor Melissa said, the Prince of Peace, a mighty Counselor, someone who will forgive you of your sins, someone who will right all of those wrongs, someone who will bring just that small flicker of hope in a world that desperately needs us. But it's not just looking back, but Advent is a season where we look forward to that time in which Christ is going to come again. And in that time where we as Christian individuals will be reconciled with God and we will be in that place that we call eternal life. And so we are in this season of looking back, concentrating on why we celebrate this Christmas season in the first place, but also looking forward to what is to come in the future. But sadly, in this particular season, what tends to happen is craziness and busyness and schedules and friends and family and activities and all of those sorts of things. And you may have experienced that this week with Thanksgiving. Maybe you had one or more different Thanksgivings that you needed to attend to. Maybe you felt the pressure to put up your Christmas decorations. Maybe you felt the pressure of families coming together. Maybe you felt all those different things. And Advent is a time to where in all of that busyness, we set aside and we prepare our hearts and we focus on something far grander and greater than decorations, than food, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? But we aren't the only ones in this particular time who are waiting for Jesus to come back. I want to just send us sort of years ago back into history And when we see at the very beginning of creation, and we talked about this last week, that God walked freely with Adam and Eve. God was with them and there was this wholeness and there was this intimacy and there was this wonderful story that God was was creating and developing. But then sin entered. And we remember that first sin where you you can have fruit and you can partake from any of these trees, but this one right in the middle of the garden, don't, don't, Take that when the serpent comes, remember from last week, and says, oh, if you, if you take from this one tree, you will have wisdom beyond what you could ever believe. That temptation. And it's like, well, what is God holding back from me? So they go and they partake of the fruit. They realize they're naked. And then that's when sin really enters into our world. And so we see this time that we realize that this restoration that God wanted to, to have at the very beginning was, was broken. This wonderful, this peacefulness, this time of tranquility was, was ruined by this initial sin. And then we look all the way throughout Scriptures, and one thing that you will notice is God is always actively working to bring God's people back to God. All throughout Scripture, and even today we see that through Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, because of the death and the resurrection of Christ, the promise of eternal life, God still is continuing to try to bring people back to God. So that's such a wonderful promise, a wonderful thing. We see even in Genesis 12.3 it says, 
All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. A promise that God gives to, to Abraham. We see in Genesis 28.15, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised for you. So God does not neglect to fulfill the promises that God gives. So we've waited 2,000 plus years after the ascension of Jesus back in to be with the Father. We've waited 2,000 years for the second coming of Christ. And so we ask ourselves, has God forgotten about us? The disciples, you can imagine, 40 days after Jesus was resurrected, He goes back to be with the Father, and you can just almost imagine them looking and saying, okay, when is Jesus going to come back? And here we still are today asking ourselves that very same question. In a world of brokenness, when is Jesus going to come back? Has God forgotten about us? And some of us, in the midst of our own life situations, we think, well, this is all nice and wonderful about God's fulfillment and promises and all of this, but what does God with us have to do with me? Those, those people weren't necessarily fighting long-term illness. Their spouse wasn't wasn't, wasn't killed overseas or their spouse didn't leave them or didn't walk away from their family. They didn't lose their job without a warning or they couldn't pay bills or they didn't have all these things and odds stacking up against them in life. And they, they had little kids who want presents but they can't provide presents to put under a tree or they can't provide a, a lights to be able to put up for Christmas or even meals to go on the table. That's all fine, Pastor, about what happened and God's promises but what about me today? How does God continue to show promise to us today? Because I can guarantee you this. This is the guarantee out of this message today. Is that no matter what problems or struggles you are going through right now, no matter what darkness you face, no matter what pain you are in, I want to encourage you not to abandon hope the same God who was with Adam and Eve, the same God who was with Abraham, the same God who was with the minor and major prophets, and the same God who was with the early disciples and apostles and developers of the church, the same God that was with your grandparents and your parents and all of those folks, and the same God that's right here today is not going to abandon us in our time of need. Amen? God loves you. God loves us. And no matter what we go through, God is not going to abandon us. See, there's this time in between the Old Testament and the New Testament called the intertestamental period. And during that time, God went silent. He didn't speak to anyone. Major and minor prophets like, you know, Isaiah. Zephaniah, you know, some of these weird names we see in the Old Testament. Some of these major and minor prophets were folks that God spoke to and often spoke on behalf of God. And then for a period of 400 or so years, before the birth of Christ, God didn't say a word. So Isaiah was a prophet that lived about 700 years before Christ was born. And Isaiah often declared things in a very public way. And he wasn't a very popular person because he often spoke out about the authorities at the time and what they were doing wrong. But during God's silence, the people should have remembered the promises that God gave to them. But because of that lapse of time, because of generations, they forgot. But Isaiah said a lot of important things that God, God told through him. And here are a couple of them in the book of Isaiah in our text. Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call His name Emmanuel. Which means what? God with us. Isaiah 9 Verses 1-2 through two says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, He humbled the land and the lands in which He was at. But the future, He will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people will, walking in darkness, will have seen a great light. On those laying the land of deep darkness, a light 
will be donned. And then finally in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, for to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government, the peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Waiting on God is never a waste of time. And these people wanted someone who was going to come in, take over the authorities, take over the government systems, and rule for them and take them out of oppression. And Jesus showed a different kind of kingdom and a different kind of way and a different kind of love and a different kind of forgiveness that they didn't expect. So after a 400-year lapse period, here's this little baby who's born in a manger in a humble place that came in the most unexpected circumstances that was supposed to be the Messiah, the Savior, they, they just couldn't wrap their minds around it. In our lives, are we patient? Do we wait on God? In the silent moments in which we pray earnestly and hard for God to reveal something to us, in those silent moments, are we still faithful to God? Because God always speaks eventually. And after 400 years, God spoke to Zechariah and gave a prophecy about someone called John the Baptist. And this prophecy was told by an angel of the Lord. So an angel of the Lord comes to Zechariah and says this in Luke 1.17, And he will go before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah and turn hearts of their parents and their children to the disobedient, to the wisdom of the righteousness, and make ready the people prepared for the Lord. So this angel of the Lord comes and says, you are going to give birth. And then they're the raise of hands of excuses just start. Well, you know, we're too old. And they were. They were old at that time. And they, there's just no way. We've tried to have children. They didn't have any children. We, we're just, there's no way that we can have children. And so all of these different excuses started to take place. But the angel of the Lord said, we have, I, we have chosen you to do something miraculous, to give s- birth to a son who's going to be John the Baptist, who's going to prepare the way for the Messiah who's going to give hope to a world who desperately needs to know it. And so in the midst of their waiting, God changed their lives forever and brought this baby boy who's going to prepare the way for the Savior. So God not only brought hope to their household, but God brought hope to the entire world. See, hope is not based on what you and I can see, but it's based on the promises of God. There are over 7,000 different promises in God's Word that you and I can lean on during the most difficult situations in our lives. God is with us. God never forsakes us. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So when you're going through those rough times, pick up a copy of God's Word and lean on those promises. And hope is also based on God's character, that God loves us, God cares for us, that God forgives us even when we really don't deserve to be forgiven. And God's character never changes. It's always consistent. We can rely that God is the same with Adam and Eve, that God is the same with them as He is with us today. And hope is based on God's faithfulness. If you recall back in your life, there are those times where you say, that was only because of God. And sometimes, friends, when we go through those valley situations in our life, those difficult spots that we have to endure, if we just stop and pause and recall that God has been faithful to us, that even when we thought that God wasn't working it out in the past, that it really did work out, and we recall those situations, we can lean on God's faithfulness. Waiting for God is never a waste of time. What are you waiting for today? What are you going through today? 
And what type of hope do you need? Because years and years ago, there was a world and generation who needed just a flicker of light. A hope. And that hope was Jesus Christ who was born. But as I look at our world, even our neighborhoods, what our world and what our neighborhoods really need is a flicker of light. And you are that flicker of light as a Christian because you have Jesus Christ in your hearts. So wherever you go this week, whatever you do, See that you are that flicker of light. You are that maybe, just maybe. You are that hope for those people that you are around wherever God may lead you. Let's stand. Let's pray. God, life sometimes can be very difficult Sometimes in silence, sometimes in turmoil, sometimes in struggle, and in other situations. But You are our hope, our strength, our place of refuge, our comforter. We thank You that You were the same yesterday, that You are the same today, and You will be the same tomorrow. We pray a very similar prayer that those in the early church did, Lord, come soon. But until You do, allow us to be those places of bright light in the midst of a dark world who needs to see Christ. We give You praise and thanks for all that You do in our world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's sing Higher Ground. The uh, lyrics are in a printout in your bulletin this morning. On the upward way
You may be seated as we join together at the Lord's <coughs> table this morning. I'll have the youth come forward. They are going to be our servers. Thank you. This is the table of the Lord. This is not our table. It's not anyone's table but the Lord's. And we are here today to share um, a meal that the Lord shared with his disciples. We share here. It is an extension. I always like to think of this table as going out all different directions all around the world to all believers, just as we are. And uh, so as we share together, may you take a moment before in this pausing time of serving to just think about, think about this season, think about the message that you've just heard about hope and the reason that we celebrate this uh, meal together today. Jesus took the bread. He held it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Let us pray. Lord God, open our hearts, open our minds to hear your voice, to hear the whisper that tells us that you are here, that you are our hope, you are our salvation. Bless this bread now as a representation of your body given for our salvation in the name of Christ, amen. And eat and remember.
In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink it as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Not for you. Let's drink together. The scriptures tell us, for whenever we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. It's always nice to see young, young folk serving in different ways, so thank you for your, your willingness to serve, help pass communion. I appreciate that. And so as we uh, continue to tell the story of Christ, we're going to stand together for our uh, new benediction song for this sermon series, which is found on page 151, or you can see it up on the screen. And it may be familiar to you already. Go tell it on the mountain. Let's stand together. <laughs> 